we know we can't just take in life, but we have to share. We have to give back. And that's what we're trying to do um, as we go along here. The hymn that we were singing talks a little bit about what we want to address today. The, the law of sin and how the Savior has uh, paid it all for me, has paid it all for us. The Lord Jesus has paid for our sin in whole. And uh, the words that we were singing, right? I, hear, I heard the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. And then the refrain, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And we remember then, recall that passage in Isaiah. So we're considering this morning just one thing about how we are under the law, okay? We are under the law of sin. As human beings, or we are in under the law of sin. But as Christians saved by grace, we are no longer under that law. And the question I just want to leave with you today is, are you under the law of sin? Or under, are you under the grace of God? That is a question everyone needs to answer. What are you under? What are you bound to? The flesh or the spirit? So we're considering this as we are being set free from sin and saved by grace and are under the law of grace. You probably know where I'm going to turn. Romans 6, please. Romans 6. And let's consider that passage of the Word of God this morning as we do. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that it is to obey its lust. Do not go on presenting the parts of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead and your body's parts as instruments instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And we skip down to verse 17. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were entrusted. And that after being freed from sin, you became slaves to righteousness. Isn't that beautiful? The law that the flesh is prone to sin. Okay? Human beings, let's face it, are prone to sin. Another way to look at it is slavery. That you are in slavery to sin. And I might just point out that that word slavery, a lot has been done with it throughout the years, and it's really um, kind of uh, disrupted, I think, people's interpretation of what, the, what that word really means. Slavery is something that meant that a slave was not his own. There was a law that he was under the ownership of the master. You just you couldn't leave that. And uh, but again, just a side note about slavery. In the, it's not like in the evil context of chains and whips and some of the things that we've been exposed to or have an understanding of slavery. This was just a metaphor, right? Some slave, slaves back in biblical times were treated much better and had much better privileges than most of us would ever understand. Um, but the illustration here is who or what are you under? Does sin own you? Does sin own you? Are you under bondage to it? Right? Are you bound to it? It is what you do is a question we all need to ask ourselves. 
Um, the flesh is prone to wander. We talked about that hymn writer that sung that song, right? Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, Lord. Seal it. The writer of that song, um, according to history, did wander away from the things of God and uh, lost it before he finally arrived. The flesh can be held bent on rebellion against righteousness. We all know that. The uh, wander away from love, from the love that we need to have, right? The love we have to have with each other and for our neighbors and the rest of the fruits of the Spirit. We just aren't wired to do that. This is a general observation. I mean, take red lights and traffic flows. I mean, we're staying at a place and there was a red light and it was perfectly clear, wasn't it, right? I could have easily gone through that red light and part of me wanted to do it. I'm like, it's totally clear. But the light was red and it kept staying red and it didn't change her green. It seemed like eons. It wouldn't change. I'm like, can't I just take it? Was that part of me? Be patient. Be patient. It'll change. Just relax. <laughs> and sure enough, what happened? Eventually it changed and we got through that intersection safely. Right? We're prone to rebel against the law, prone to speed. Um, on a more serious note, addiction and fentanyl is an illustration of being a slave to sin I cannot leave out here, given that fentanyl is the biggest killer in youth today. Um, it is an addiction. Um, it is alluring. The government says drugs are okay. There's movements to legalize it. Uh, it feels good at first, but it's a killer. Um, it's not like the old days when I was growing up in the 1980s and 90s where they said, you know, drugs will just mess up your mind, which was true, right? It might make you psychotic. It might do this. You might have to go to a, a mental hospital if you take drugs. Now it will kill you. And so we need to get the message out to uh, people and to our children about drug prevention ministry, the idea of confronting drugs and saying this is not what you do. Don't be enslaved by drug addiction. When you see people on the street as you drive through the inner cities, walking around like zombies and shooting up in street corners and in, uh, in front of shops and businesses, these were normal people one day. These were husbands, fathers, children, son, daughters, some of them were professional businessmen, and they ended up there because they were enslaved to sin. Abusing drugs is a sin. It's not a illness, okay? It started with a sin of using a substance when we should all look to God himself and the spirit of the living God for every piece of sustenance we need and every bit of fulfillment that we need. Never ever a substance, including alcoholism. All right, getting high, um, sexual immorality, right? The law says that the human being will get into trouble and sin inevitably. Um, and that is as certain as what goes up must come down. It is the law. Um, but a wonderful uh, parallel I heard um, last week from uh, Brother Dr. Tony Evans, um, and I would want to expound on this wonderful parallel, which is about flight. And while the law of sin it says what goes up must come down, we can all see and understand that we can change that law. We can change the law, just like an airplane can seemingly defy the laws of gravity, go up and remain up. How does that happen? Even for a long period of time. So we can change the law that we're under. And uh, as a pilot myself, I fully understand this picture very vividly, that while it's true what goes up must come down, 
according to that law of physics, uh, when we fly an airplane, we are under a different law and under a different set of rules and a different set of principles which make flight possible, i.e. lift and thrust, which uh, counter weight and drag, noting the four forces that act on an aircraft. And as we observe this law extremely carefully as pilots, right, we don't make mistakes, you can't. There's no room in aviation to make mistakes. Is a general observation of flight safety. You can't just say I'm prone to error and so I forgot to check the fuel and we ran out of gas over the mountainous terrain and we're all killed. You have to be that of precision and we'll just get into that a bit as we continue to expound upon this powerful metaphor. We observe the principles carefully and we find ourselves under this different law and behold, the wondrous reality of flight is possible. And look how that has changed the world since the Wright brothers. And now a man like never before can take the safest form of transportation and basically fly anywhere in the planet. I think we hear an airliner going right over us right now. Fly anywhere in the air. Take liberty to fly anywhere on the planet. And arrive to the destination with relative confidence. Safely, right? We can get there safely. Flight is truly a wondrous reality. Um, I remember taking off in uh, my Cessna 172 in solo. And just the feeling of the acceleration. And feeling the forces of the wing act and do what they're supposed to do and counter gravity as you take up climb into the wild blue yonder. There is no experience like it um, on this earth. In like manner, the Christian is not under law, but under the law or principle, if you like, of grace. In this case, we can mount up with wings of eagles. That famous passage was a comparison to flight, wasn't it? Those that wait on the Lord. But um, as I said before, we can't be careless, right? We cannot be careless um, as we uh, are under this new principle of grace. How do I say that? Read verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we're under the law? Because we're not under this law? i.e. the law of sin, the law of the flesh, but under grace, may it never be far from it. And I could tell you aviation is a unique uh, field and study, and it is one of extreme precision, and for good reason. I remember when I was doing airline manufacturing, the tolerances were five thousandths of an inch for some of these uh, measurements when you're cutting out pieces of airframe. You couldn't accept air when you're putting together an airplane. It was unacceptable. Okay? You needed a micrometer, a, a thing that could measure things like talking to about the size of a hair here, right? Right down to that. It was important. Precision is important. Christian, understand. Precision is important. Don't get it wrong on this one. Don't take grace for granted. The principle of grace. Look to the Lord. Trust in the Lord. It's important as we look in aviation for the whole people. Not only the pilot has to be in with this principle, but all for everybody. The ground crew, maintenance workers, air traffic controllers, right down to the manufacturer themselves and so on. One small leak or one small error can lead to disastrous consequences. Just watch an episode of Mayday. Okay, I read a story of the Boeing 757 out of Peru, South America, and the cause of the crash was simply because the ground crew forgot to take the protective covering off of the essential instrument breathing tubes and sensors. One mistake caused that, one oversight. 
And digging a bit deeper, I would say as a pilot, it was ultimately the, the fault of the captain because a captain should always go around the aircraft and do a walk around inspection of it and make sure everything's okay just before he takes off and flies it, okay? Be careful, we always wanna be careful. Can we see the parallel here a bit? Can you see it? It's true that none of us are perfect, but would you get on the airplane knowing what the understanding that your maintenance crew, pilots, and all the people responsible for that system said, I'm not perfect, so I don't know if this airplane will work, but maybe it will. Maybe you'll get to your destination safely. Would you get on that airplane? Person says, well, we do make mistakes here, and uh, but uh, go on in the seat and we'll, we'll get you to the, your, your destination. No, the answer is we cannot accept um, errors when we're under the rules of flight. I think it's a beautiful principle, and those of you in aviation would appreciate it, but I've been in aviation basically all my life, even to this day. Um, it represents my business in my career, and I know for a fact it's about precision and it's about making sure we maintain safety at all time and to never get reckless or pragmatic or ex start to excuse our errors or, or what have you. As Christians, we can never be complacent, even as we, by the grace of God, defy the laws of sin. Ah, we can never take that for granted. We are free from sin. Sin doesn't have dominion over us. Sin is not our master. So it doesn't have dominion over us. Even though we all sin, even though sometimes we make mistakes, and as I mentioned, are prone to, uh, to sin in many, many ways. After you get saved, you can rise above it. You can be steadfast you can be under the principle of grace and be saved. Number two, we're not under the wages of death is the second takeaway from this passage. Um, John 3.16 confirms that those who go on believing do not perish. So once again, we discover with God's truth, we can be, we can defeat the law of death, basically. And so how do we see that? Romans uh, 6, 22. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. That's the law, okay? But the gracious gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. See that? The wages, i.e. the law, wages are due, right? It's a legal obligation to pay wages, is death. That's the rule. That's the law. But once again, we can defeat it because of the gracious gift of God, which results in eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. For the one who goes on believing. Who is this reward for? The one that goes on believing. Not just a one-time event in his life. The one one is believing in steadfastness, faithfulness to the Lord. The one who is saved by grace. This is another law we can rise above. A law, another law we can seemingly defy, right? With the law of grace. We can defy that law of death by the law of grace, by the principles of grace. For the saved, for those that are, that are saved, who are genuinely saved, death is just a shadow which cannot touch or harm you. It's just a shadow. You have reaped to the Spirit. You have reaped and sown to the Spirit, um, not the flesh. The flesh is passing and temporal. Time is so short. The law of death states that one out of one die. I always kind of get amused with statistics about how many people die. <laughs> as if 
certain people live forever. It's not the case. One out of one die. That's the law. Since we have all sinned, we have to die, period. But once again, we can see there's a way we can defy the law. As we've mentioned, right? We can defy the law because of the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus the Lord. The mystery of the resurrection is plainly told to us here. Now I say then, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50. Now I say this, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I am telling you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we will be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then will we come about the sayings that is written. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of sin, of death, is sin. And the power of sin is the law. Just what we're talking about there. See that? How they're connected? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be firm, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So here we can see what specifically happens when we defy the law of death. Yes, the outer body is corrupt. The bodies that we live in are corrupt. They have to be changed into the new body. And that's what happens in that moment, that twinkling of an eye. If we sleep, or if some of us are still alive, as we can read, and we do not sleep, at the end of the tribulation, we shall be changed in a moment when we go to be with the Lord as a holy entourage. Isn't that just wonderful? Um, today, sadly, uh, many are fanatically concerned about their physical bodies. Um, but God is far more concerned about our spiritual bodies. And in like manner, we also should be. And of course, this does not mean that we shouldn't be caring about our own physical bodies, our own health, our own healing of our bodies and our joints, as we're remembering and talking about those issues of, of uh, being dislocated and so on. That the, It's a good metaphor of the healing of the physical body to uh, healing and restoration of your spiritual body and your spiritual walk to make sure you're being healed with uh, the problems and so on you have in your life. But spiritual health always comes first in like manner to the teachings of the Lord Jesus where he said what? Seek first your physical health? No. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, i.e. his truth. So, uh, yeah, I mean, taking care of the physical bodies which God has given us is a challenge and is important, especially in a day and age that we live in of s serious physical ailments and serious problems and pain and agony and so on. Uh, but in moderation, we are wise with the bodies God has given us. But the point here, among many wonderful things, is that our bodies will not inherit the kingdom of God. Our physical bodies that we now have will not inherit the kingdom of God. Under any circumstance, that we will be changed. 
This is the awesome hope that we have. New glorified bodies under a whole new set of rules and laws fit for the kingdom of God. Much, much better than our current ones we have right now. We never put our confidence in the current flesh or the current bodies that we have. Our trust is in the Lord our God. The Lord our God who has saved us and who has redeemed us and given us hope and uh, a claim that we can lay a hold of, that inheritance in the new kingdom. Lastly, and in closing, um, we give thanks, verse 57, to God in Christ, who gives us victory. Always give thanks to the Lord who has given us our life, who has given us the hope of redemption, who has given us a purpose and a way where we can have absolute confidence knowing that we can put our trust in him and that he will save us in the end save us from sin and save us from the world how can we achieve this victory how can we say we're not under the law of sin how can we say that we are capable of doing righteous deeds that god is pleased with that was, that's become our capability. Well, it all comes back to the work the Lord Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. The work that he did in that hymn that we were singing. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. And so... The Lord Jesus can redeem you. The Lord Jesus can save you. He can set you on a new path that will mean healing and strength and peace in your soul and in your life. Um, many people have been under the vice of drug addiction, and they would testify before you that they have been delivered from that by the power of of the Lord Jesus Christ who saved them from sin. That was the only thing that stopped them from progressing down a road of drug addiction and death. Every sinner needs the Lord. Call upon Jesus. If you have not done that today, please, by the authority of God's word, put your confidence and your trust in the Lord. Repent of sin. Ask the Lord into your life to heal and redeem you. And do not delay. Do it with haste. Don't walk to the cross. Run to the cross. The days are getting short. The time of the Lord Jesus' return has never been sooner than ever before in the history of the world. We know that, and we have confidence that he will save us from sin and indeed from this the um the evils of this world jesus became propitiation substitutionary atonement we remember that at the lord's supper he gave everything to us and uh, poured himself out as an offering a perfect offering he was the scapegoat and now he is our great high priest there is none likened unto him. And his desire is to save sinners who call upon the name of the Lord. Um, Harry Lighty was a uh, Christian minister back in uh, Scotland, and he wrote that beloved hymn, Abide With Me. And here was a man whose health had, had failed uh, at his middle life around in his 50s. And he penned these beloved words that have gone on after him in that wonderful hymn. 
as he was trying to seek therapy, as he was trying to take care of his physical body, it became very clear with tuberculosis that it was something he was going to accept, that his outer flesh was mortal. It was indeed mortal. The outer flesh was corruptible, and he would have to come to terms with that as he struggled with that terrible disease that would restrict air into the lungs and so on. I need thee. I need thy presence every passing hour. What but thy grace can foil the tempter's power? Who like thyself, my guide and stay can be? Through cloud and sunshine, Lord, abide with me. No, I fear no foe, he goes on, with thee at hand to bless. Ills have no weight and tears no bitterness. Where is death's sting? Where grave thy victory? I triumph still if thou abide with me. That's not just poetry. That is real. That was real for him. Death had no sting. The grave did not have a victory. Why? Because Jesus was there abiding with him through those difficulties that he was facing. I hope that is the case for you today. There is no shortage of people out there right now that are in pain. We've heard of friends and family that are in pain right now, some of them from loss, some of them from sickness, some of them have COVID-19 and are wrestling with that and trying to deal with it with secondary problems, with heart problems, etc. We need the Lord Jesus to give us, as the, the hymn writer wrote, right? No bitterness. Oh, there may be sadness. Oh, there may be pain. But we have our eyes fixated on something much greater. Something that doesn't perish. Something that lasts forever. Something that is much greater than any problem we could face in this world. We have our eyes on Jesus. Yeshua Adonai, the Holy One of Israel, the Messiah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord as we pray. Thank you, Father, for giving us victory over the law of sin, giving us victory over death, hell, and the grave, and giving us victory that we can uh, rejoice and give you thanksgiving and praise as we would commit ourselves to thee, as we would entrust our lives to thee. We thank you for this day, for the wonderful blessings you've given to us, and pray that you could be with us. And for any that need to commit themselves to you, we pray they could do that now in the spirit of the living God and by the grace of the Lord Jesus who has given us a way that we can be saved with the plan of salvation. Oh, we thank you, O oh Lord, for thy grace and thy mercy upon us that we can give you praise and glory and thanksgiving all the days of our lives as we look forward to a time when we will be with the Lord with new bodies in that holy kingdom. So accept our praise as we give you praise and glory and thanksgiving in Jesus' name.